Angela Small is typical of of a grassroots person like ourselves who she's a registered nurse and she was getting mad about things that were going on and became very active and uh, and, th and that's really what it's about people from the grassroots so Angela come on up here Angela has got some very done some very interesting research on what's going on with the UN regarding what their plans are with property tax with the project 2020 vision. So everybody, please welcome Angela Small. You had your... Uh, Did you stay on there? You can take it, but I want you to stay because we're... Yes, I got you. you anyway, you have a... Uh, I can just forward through here. Did you want the PowerPoint that you... Uh, yes. There we go. And then you can just up and down it from this point. Easy. Okay, perfect. Angela Small, everybody. Thank you, thank you. One more thing. Save your questions afterwards for our three speakers. We're going to have a Q&A session afterwards, so just hang on to your questions rather than doing it after every, every person, okay? Right. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Well, I am honored and humbled that you guys would even come and hear anything that I have to say because um, in the political landscape and out there in the world, I'm kind of a nobody. <laughs> so, um, but I promise you by the end of this, uh, hopefully I will inspire all of you to learn a lot more about a uh, very big, big topic that I'm going to show you guys tonight. I'm going to apologize in advance if you feel like I'm fire hosing you with information because I am. I have 20 minutes to go through um, something that's really, really big. So I'm going to give it to you in bite-sized chunks. It's going to be very cliff note style. And um, just so all of you are aware, I do have a digital ebook that you guys can all purchase if this is something that you want to have on your phone as you go and talk to people. Something else I just want to bring to your attention. This is, I know this is a Republican party group. But this is a very nonpartisan issue, what I'm going to talk about. And why that's important is because, obviously, you all know we're coming into an election year. And this is something that is a really, really good talking point for the other side. And I can say that with, um, I, I know for a fact, because I, I have talked to people all over the place. And I bring this subject content to them. And they are starting to change their mind and how they see things and who they're going to vote for and that sort of thing. So it's very important. So who am I? So I am the, uh, I'd say, co-influencer of a movement that I hope will really take hold here in the United States and especially here in Michigan. Uh, we started a movement called Project 2020 Vision and our mission is to educate, connect, and mobilize average everyday citizens to get involved in their local area concerning all things related to the year 2030. The year 2030, that's what we're gonna be talking about today and it is very important and you will understand by the time we're done with this. So, I was reading a poll and it said 79% of people in America know something is very, very wrong. That was me, as Mark just said, or Matt, I'm sorry, <laughs> as Matt just said, I am a registered nurse and when the COVID pandemic first hit, I knew something wasn't right. I didn't know what it was, I didn't know what it meant, I didn't know where it was coming from, and my husband can attest to this, I was on a war path, I was obsessed with trying to figure out what in the world is going on. I was fortunate enough to come across a lady, her name is Rosa Corey, if you guys have never listened to her before, I highly suggest that you look her up on YouTube. She was a um, commercial real estate appraiser, and she was talking about this thing, Agenda 21, and I will be very honest, when I first heard it, I thought, uh, that's conspiracy theory, that's crazy, there's no way. But I chose to do what nurses are trained to do, which is critically think, right? You don't just believe things because you hear them. Everything has to be evidence-based. And so I approached that with this approach, and I'm going to take you through in a very cliff note, very, very fast um, way to show you exactly what I've come up with. So. Everything that I say today is 100% factual. If it's my opinion, I will tell you it's my opinion. Everything that I'm telling you today has been heavily vetted, so I just want you guys to feel comfortable with what I'm saying. I'm not just making this stuff up. Okay, so just follow along with me. This may not make sense at first, but I promise you it'll make sense by the end. The United Nations, I know you guys are all, from my understanding, everyone in this room is pretty savvy on what's happening in the world and the United Nations. 
but I want you to start thinking about the people that aren't savvy, all right? Because what I want to do is I want to empower you and educate you to start having these conversations outside of your circles, right? Because what we're going to talk about today is going to require everyone's consent. And if we can start teaching people about this and teaching them to say no, regardless of which side of the coin they're on, Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. If we can get people to start saying no, we have a shot at actually stopping this because this is a very, very well-funded, well-organized plan. So most of us know the United Nations as um, for their peacekeeping efforts, for the humanitarian aid around the world, but very few people know that the United Nations has a plan to implement uh, land use policy changes in every single city, state, and town across America. Now, this is actually global, but for sanity's sake, we're gonna to stick to the United States, all right? But very few people are, are aware of that. So very few people are also unaware that the United Nations is behind this term sustainable development, which we, we, we all know now. We've all heard sustainable development is being crammed down our throats. The average person, when you go out and talk to them and you ask them, what is sustainable development? What does that mean? And they'll give, you, they'll give you answers like this. It's an effort to save the planet from climate change, right? Uh, it's instituting green energy, more responsible energy usage, better waste control, recycling, that sort of thing. That's what people think this is about. And they don't understand that the United Nations has uh, different plans than what, than what the average person thinks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the history of where that, that term sustainable development came from and how it got us here today. I'm hoping to connect some dots. These last few years have been like world gone mad, right? And it came out of nowhere. And I'm, I'm hoping to connect some dots so that you see the organization and that it wasn't just this haphazard kind of thing that happened, all right? So, Let's start with Maurice Strong. Who was Maurice Strong? He was a former director of the United Nations Environmental Program and chairman of the World Wildlife Program, which I will explain to you in just a little bit. These were his main beliefs. Capitalism cannot meet the needs of the population and must be replaced with socialism. He was a professed socialist. Do a quick Google search on Maurice Strong and you will see the kind of person that this is. All right, not a good guy. Why is that important? Maurice Strong actually coined the term sustainable development. All right, so you gotta go back to the root of the person that coined the term that they're trying to sell us now in the name of environmental justice, all right? What he said was, sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the needs of future generations. Nothing nefarious about that, right? No one would argue that. But what he did was he wrote a book in 1987 called Our Common Future, I have it here, I read it, it's an actual book. And this is where he coins the term sustainable development. And this, just on the surface, sounds good until you actually read the book. Most people don't read the book. And he talks about all the rights that you're gonna have to give up and all the things that they're gonna have to put us through for sustainable development. So what did he do? In 1987, he took his idea of sustainable development to the United Nations and I'm just, I'm quickly paraphrasing all this. It's a little more complex than this, but he took his idea to the United Nations. The United Nations said, you know what? That sounds great. We're gonna give you five years. We, we need to come up with an action plan. So we're gonna fast forward to the year 1992. 1992 was the unveiling of Agenda 21. And that's this book. You can buy this on the unitednations.org. I am not making this up. I know Agenda 21 sounds conspiratorial right off the get. It is not, all right? You can get this on Amazon, United Nations website. So what exactly is this? Our common future was the, uh, the concept of what we need to do to protect the environment. But they didn't have an action plan. So Agenda 21 is that action plan. It's a 300-page implementation plan for sustainable development that was created by the United Nations and introduced in 1992 at the United Nations Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. Please hear this. It is an action plan constructed by the United Nations to inventory and control all land, all water, all minerals, all plants, all animals, all construction, all information, all energy, all production, all law enforcement, and all human beings in the world. That's what this is, all right? George Bush, at the time, was president in 1992. It's, uh, it's a very common thing for the president of the United States to be the, the one to present 
you know, new ideas. They're usually like the keynote speaker there at these uh, United Nations gatherings. So George Bush was our president. He signed us on to Agenda 21 along with 187 other countries. Donald Trump was the first president, the first sitting president to take us off of Agenda 21. So when people, when people, when you look back at how angry they were when he became president, that's why. Because they have put years and years and billions and billions and trillions of dollars into this. And he, God just threw us a wild card. <laughs> he really threw us a wild card. So, at this, at this Earth Summit in 1992, again, we're going to go back to our friend Maurice Strong. And he opened, it, he opened the United Nations Summit up with these words. Current lifestyle and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, use of fossil fuels, appliances, air conditioning, and suburban, suburban housing are not sustainable. Then he goes on to say, isn't it the only hope for the planet that industrialized civilizations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? So picture this. He's talking to 187 other nations, and he's saying, isn't it our responsibility to bring what about? The collapse of civilized societies. For what? In the name of the environment. So, we have our common future in 1987. 1992 was the unveiling of Agenda 21. So, Agenda 21 was the action plan, but what they didn't have was the nuts and bolts of what does the world look like under Agenda 21. And that's what this big blue book is. It's called the Global Biodiversity Assessment. I have it here. I have read most of it, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I've spent hours and hours digging through this, trying to find answers to some really, really hard questions. This book was actually written by 1,500 scientists that were, that were hired by the United Nations to give us that picture of what the world looks like under Agenda 21, and I'm going to take you through that right now. What's the name? It's the Global Biodiversity Assessment. I will have them up top too if anyone wants to see them afterwards. All right, so what does Agenda 21 say is unsustainable? Well, first of all, it says private lands are unsustainable. That's on page 782, and that's why what Carla Wagner is going to talk about today is so important. It also talks about the Wildlands Project, which I'm going to talk to you in just a little bit. That's on page 993. It also goes on to say suburbs, private vehicles, air conditioning, appliances, golfing, skiing, fishing, gardens, pastures, meat eating, roads and concrete, dams. The legal system is not sustainable because it doesn't represent the environment. Not not my words, theirs. All right? Consumerism and people over a number of one billion are unsustainable. So let's go through Agenda 21 really quick. Some, some quick points here. Agenda 21, please know these are, and you guys, I know, I know you guys know this, they are made up of unelected global and local governance. We did not vote for these people, but the problem is they're using the people that we are voting in or the people that got in, <laughs> right? Agenda 21 also calls for public-private partnerships. This is also where your ESG score starts to come in. If you don't know what an ESG score is, please, please, please study that, understand it, because this is how they're going to implement a lot of this. Public-private partnerships, a really, really good example of that is during the COVID pandemic and let's say Facebook and the government, right? The government went to Facebook and said, these are the people that you need to censor. That's public-private partnership. So let's understand ESG a little bit more. So when you start to study this and you get into the United Nations website, and you can find all this on their website, they have these three pillars of, of sustainable development where social, environmental, and economic issues in the world all need to meet in this sweet little spot in the middle, and that's what they say is sustainable. So ESG is like a social credit score. It stands for Environmental Social Governance. And it's, uh, it's their way of implementing social equity, which is basically where no one has more than anyone else. All right? No one has more food. No one has more money. No one has access to more water, bigger house than their neighbor. No one has access to more health care. No one has access to more land use, transportation, energy. No one has more children than anyone else, and so on and so forth. 
It also calls for, um, it has a strict population policy. And I told you on page 773, this is what it states about the one billion people. It is, an est it is estimated that an agricultural world in which most human beings are peasants would be able to support five to seven billion people. In contrast, a reasonable estimate for an industrialized world society at the present North American material standard of living would be one billion. So they're saying we've got two options here in the name of the environment. Remember, this is all about, about the climate. We either get the population down to one billion so we can all continue to live how North America lives with your cars and your air conditioning and your appliances, right? Or everyone has to live like peasants. And that's on page 773. Um, they are also indoctrinating our children I have the book here. This is the children's edition of Agenda 21. There's a page in here that says the earth groans every time it registers a new birth. That's what they're teaching them. What's the name of that one? Rescue, Rescue Mission. Yep. Um, it calls for intense support of reproductive rights, especially women's rights. That is what Proposal 3 was all about here in Michigan. Michigan is actually really important in this whole battle against this, and I'll show you why in the end, but that's what Proposal 3 was all about. It puts the wealthy and the poor on the same playing field. Again, this is a socialist agenda. It's, um, it calls for strict migration policies in favor of open borders. So now maybe what's happening at the border makes sense, right? As soon as we switch to administrations, what happened? Borders open. No rationale for it, no reasoning for it, no law behind it. It's just because it's part of Agenda 21. It allows for the monitoring, metering, and restricting of our energy and water use via smart meters. Yeah, everyone's being pushed smart meters. They can absolutely 100% take control. I don't know if you guys read about that when they had that heat wave in Colorado and they took over those people's thermostats. And they said, we're only going to allow you this much. It declares our public lands off limits to human use. So this map was actually presented back in the, uh, earlier. I mentioned the Wildlands Project. And this map was actually part of the Wildlands Project. It was actually struck down in the Senate back in 1994. But please know it has not gone anywhere. They have just renamed it. It's now called the Rewilding Project. And it's part of Biden's uh, 30 by 30 plan, if you guys haven't heard of that, where 30% um, of our lands are owned. Uh, by the government by the year 2030. But the takeaway on this map is everything in red and yellow is not for human use. Literally everything in red and yellow is not for human use. Red is completely off limits. Yellow is what they call buffer zones. Uh, buffer zones maybe will uh, very, very minimal human use. Uh, this is like scientists and that sort of thing that are going to be allowed in these areas. You can't see it probably very well. There's little blurbs of green in there. Uh, that are kind of sporadically placed, and that's where you and I are going to live. They're no longer called cities. They're called normal use zones of cooperation, <laughs> is what they're called, believe it or not. Agenda 21 is going to restrict private property to a select few, and again, that's why I really hope you guys pay attention to Carla Wagner and really understand what she's trying to do. It's much bigger than just saving you a couple thousand dollars a, month, or a year. It's much, much bigger, and you'll understand that in a minute. This is what the Agenda 21 book, the yellow book, says. I didn't, I didn't do it. It just fell off. Uh, concerning land. It says land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contribute, contribute to social injustice. If unchecked, it may become a major obstacle in the planning and implementation of development schemes, and schemes they are. <laughs> the provision of decent dwellings and healthy conditions for the people can only be achieved if land is used in the interests of society as a whole. Public control of land use is therefore indispensable. Agenda 21 also will institute a carbon uh, CO2 tax on businesses. This is probably how they're going to go ahead and... Yeah. Hey, I'm just pinning random stuff to my sweater. I'm like, I have no idea what this thing is. Anyways, um, it's going to institute a carbon tax on industry. This is how they will absolutely 100% get rid of um, your, your, your middle class, your small business owners. They won't be able to afford this. It's also going to destroy our dams and pulverize our roads. 
and it's going to introduce something called regionalism. If you guys don't understand what that is, please start, under, please start studying that. The goal is, is to get everyone into a region, or what they call a city center. I, ha I have different, these are all different names of, as I've studied this, I've grabbed names out of these books. But they're called green city centers, mega districts, human settlements, islands of human habitation, urbanization projects, and 15 minute cities. They're all one and the same. But basically what they look like is, because they're saying you can no longer be in your private home because that's not socially just. It's not fair that you live on a home and this person over here doesn't. So the goal is to get everyone off of their property. And believe me, they will tax you and regulate you out of your homes. That is the goal. That's what they want to do, tax you and regulate you out of your homes. But everyone's going to live in a mega district, whatever you want to call it. The average apartment's going to be 600 square feet. If you go to major downtown, even if you go downtown Detroit, you can see it. Uh, this mixed use uh, zoning that they're doing where everything is real um, shopping on the bottom floor and then like pack and stack apartments on the top, right? That's where everyone's going to live. In case you don't believe me, you can go on to a website called America2050.org. And interestingly enough, when you go to that, it'll redirect you to the Regional Planning Association. You scroll about halfway down the front page, and it says Defining U.S. Mega Regions. There's a PDF on there. You click on it. About halfway through the PDF, you can find this map, and they already have the 11 regions mapped out for us. As you can see, the Great Lakes up near us is the biggest. Major railways connecting every uh, mega region. Electric cars would be mandatory, but most likely obsolete. They want to connect them by railways, so you won't even have to drive anywhere. How are they making this happen? Uh, through an organization called ICLE. ICLE stands for the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives, which is tasked with carrying out the goals of Agenda 21. This was actually started by Bill Clinton when he formed his President Council on uh, Sustainable Development. So. Why are you so important, all right? This is a YouTube video, I'm, I'm not gonna show it, but you guys can take a screenshot if you want, you can watch it later. This is actually Maurice Strong, and I, I grabbed something that he said out of this that was really important. The future of civilization is very much in the hands of those who make local decisions, which determine the direction of society. Uh, there has to be a relationship between what is happening at the local level and what is happening at the global level because what is happening at the global level is just a collection of what is happening at the local level. Your involvement in this, your understanding of this, you uh, going out and educating people on this is, is beyond important. Remember, they need our consent. And if we can get enough people to understand this and say no, even if they don't understand it to its core like maybe I do, enough where they're uncomfortable enough with it to not go along with it, we actually have a shot. So why haven't you heard of Agenda 21? I got about two more minutes and I'm done. Why haven't you heard of Agenda 21? Well, this is Jake Gary Lawrence. He's a renowned planner and he was also an advisor to the President's Council on Sustainable Development. And this is a, a quote from him. Participating in a UN advocated planning process would very likely bring about many who would actively work to defeat any elected official undertaking local Agenda 21. So we will call our process something else, such as comprehensive planning, growth management, or smart growth. I guarantee right now, whatever city you live in, if you go and look into your city planner, like your, the plans for the city, you will see all three of these words. I guarantee it. And they are not using your, uh, your elected officials, they're using like your city planners and your city managers because those people are appointed. They're not elected. They're not responsible to you. All right, so where are we at now? You will no longer hear it called Agenda 21. What happened in 2015 was the United Nations reassembled and they said, hey, we had this agenda for the 21st century, but it's not moving fast enough and we have to put a time stamp on it. So they gave, in 2015, they all agreed on the year 2030. If you, if you go on your phone right now, every single major city in the United States has a, a, has a 2030 plan. Detroit, 2030, Minneapolis, 2030, New York, 2030, every single major city has a 2030 plan. So this is very organized, very, very organized, and it's very serious. Um, this is actually just a screenshot of uh, the new Detroit 2030 district. You see how they're using the language? They're trying to get you used to that language. You can go to this website and check it all out for yourself. So why is Michigan so important? I know you guys just had a speaker, I think maybe back in the summer, 
Um, I don't remember his name, but he was talking about Gretchen Whitmer and the World Economic Forum and her being keynote speaker. And people, and he was trying to explain why. Well, this is why. If you go on the World Economic Forum, so the World Economic Forum, if you're not privy to who they are, they're just another arm of the United Nations. United Nations deals with social policy. The World Economic Forum, again, unelected global governance. They just they deal with um, economic issues, business issues. So the World Economic Forum has actually established its global center for urban transformation transformation in Detroit. Detroit has been chosen by the World Economic Forum to be their pilot program for the rest of the country. That is why Whitmer was a keynote speaker at the last World Economic Forum talk they had. Yes. All right. So one last thought. I used to go crazy over this. Like I said, I was a nurse. I couldn't understand what I was witnessing in the hospital. All right. The doctors, the nurses, people that were mentors to me, these are very, very smart, educated, usually very, very rational people, and I couldn't understand. And so I was at home one day in the shower, and I said, how did Hitler get an entire country to do what, what he wanted them to do? And I came across this. It's called an Hegelian dialectic. Hegel was a German philosopher, and he created the term dialectic, which was a concept for ideology and control. And this is how Hitler did what he did because he's got many statements about Hegel and how he used his uh, philosophies. A crisis is created and used to dupe citizens into surrendering their sovereignty in small chunks over time while convincing them that they're actually empowering themselves. The crisis today is climate change. Regardless of your stance on it, there is, I'm not saying we shouldn't take better care of the environment and not every environmental program is bad, but they are using that crisis to get you and I and the people out there that are unaware and the people are falling for it, hook, line, and sinker. Hook, line, and sinker. So, thank you. You guys, I have a website. It's called project2020vision.com. You can email me here at info at project2020vision.com. I really, you guys can sign up to my email list. I am going to be starting a sub stack because um, I do want to dig into this a lot deeper and keep people educated. So, uh, I would really appreciate if you guys would uh, support me in that way. And I also do have the manuals. They're digital copies. Really, really smart to have a digital copy because you can take them with you. Um, so as you talk to people, you have all the resources there. So thank you. Angela Small. Q&A will be later.